It's so nice to see how well this conference is uh, uh, taking place. I, I'd like to think this is the best value investment uh, seminar conference that uh, exists. And uh, George is in the, this is the eighth year. Let's give uh, George, it's a lot of work, give him a nice round of applause. And I like the way, George, you've got many of the investment community uh, involved in it. Um, so I can't uh, but uh, add this uh, little uh, perspective. You know, inflation, deflation, problems, um, depression reminded me of this story about this um, person who, um, an elderly man, who um, remembered the good old days. And he said, when I was young, my mom could send me to a shop with a single dollar, one dollar, and I could bring back five pounds of potatoes, two pounds of bread, a pound of milk, a piece of cheese, and 10 eggs. Nowadays, he says, that's impossible. There are simply too many security cameras. <laughs> <laughs> but it is my pleasure to uh, introduce to you um, Lawrence Larry Cunningham. Larry Cunningham, as um, all of you value investors know, he studied the best value investor in the world, Warren Buffett. He studied him for a whole number of years, and he's got two books that he's written essential reading. You know, Ben Graham, Security Analysis, used to be the book that you had to read, and it still is, Intelligent Investor, lots of stuff written on, um, on uh, uh, Warren Buffett. But the essays of Warren Buffett, Lessons for Corporate America, I found it fantastic reading through it many times. And the more recent book, I think, Warren Buffett Shareholder, Stories from Inside the uh, Berkshire Hathaway annual meeting, two essential books. Larry's got uh, copies there. He will sign them for you and, um, and have them for you. You'll have to pay, of course. Uh, <laughs> but, uh, but Larry, of course, is a professor at um, um, a professor at George Washington University Law School. He lectures on corporate governance in the main campus of Washington, D.C. Um, and it is such a big advantage uh, having uh, Larry here. Give him a nice round of applause, a nice round of applause. Many, many thanks, Prem, for that delightful introduction and for the honor of joining you at this, and I agree, the premier value investing conference. I'm currently working on a book with that provisional title, Attracting Quality Shareholders, and it's a work in progress, but I'm delighted for the opportunity to share some interim discoveries and viewpoints with a perfectly relevant audience. When you think about the ideal shareholder base, it helps to recall the insights of Phil Fisher. He a, was a legendary investor, as you probably know, who likened companies to restaurants. They all offer a menu attracting a corresponding clientele. For restaurants, five-star menus attract gourmets, fast food shops attract eaters on the run, and smorgasbords or buffets attract a indiscriminating crowd. Warren Buffett, to whom Prem referred, took Phil Fisher's point a step further. Companies draw particular shareholders by communicating a specific corporate message. Backed by action, the message produces a self-selected shareholder group with particular outlooks on various vectors such as time horizon, concentration level, and engagement. Buffett has practiced the art of shareholder cultivation since his earliest days running Berkshire. He has long promoted the menu in his shareholder letters. A popular paraphrase of his early 1979 letter says, you get the shareholders you deserve. Buffett sought and got what he calls high quality shareholders. These are defined as shareholders who buy large stakes 
and hold for long periods. They contrast with indexers who may hold for long periods but never concentrate, and transients who may bar buy large stakes but never hold for long. Buffett refined Berkshire's menu in his 1983 letter saying, we are going to communicate this menu in clear and consistent terms and provide no conflicting messages. He said he wants to attract shareholders who see themselves as part and permanent owners of the business. He wants people who will work to understand the company, the managers, in its philosophy. He wants shareholders who focus on the business and not on stock price. But back then, Berkshire attracted almost exclusively high quality shareholders. Thanks to Buffett's advertisements, his letters, 98% of Berkshire shares outstanding at year end were owned by those who own the stock at the beginning of the year. Over rolling five-year periods, at least 90% of Berkshire shareholders remain the same from year one to year five. Almost all Berkshire shares were held by concentrated investors. Their position in Berkshire was twice as large as their next biggest position in any company's stock. Now Berkshire's record of attracting quality shareholders remains extraordinary. But all those figures are a little lower today, largely due to the changed and fragmented shareholder universe. Nowadays, index funds rule, though they were novelties through the 1980s and into the 1990s. Today, up to 40% of publicly traded equity is owned by index funds, either declared or closet. Uh, you know what a closet indexer, indexer is, the person who proclaims to be a stock picker but actually assembles a, a, a vast diversified portfolio that ends up hugging an index. These funds owning small stakes in hundreds or thousands of companies cannot possibly understand the vast majority of them. Transient traders have long prowled the stock markets, but average holding periods fell greatly from the 80s and 90s and into the 2000s, so that today they average two or three years for most shareholder segments and below one for many. As a group, transients are as dominant as indexers, sporadically commanding around 40% of publicly traded equity, and nearly as disadvantaged in understanding any particular company. Such a rise of indexers and transients created a vacuum in managerial accountability that has been filled by shareholder activists. These have a diverse range of time horizons, commitments, and agendas, and while variably controlling only five or so percent of the public equity markets, they wage high intensity campaigns that delivers them outsized influence. But while times have changed over Buffett's tenure, Berkshire remains a magnet for quality shareholders. This bar graph shows the distribution of shareholders along a few company groupings. There in the middle is the median cohort representing the universe, about 40% index, 40% transient, 15% or so quality, and the opportunity for activists. And then to the, to the left and right, or a little above that median, uh, a little below, and way off uh, at the far right in the extreme is Berkshire, which has relatively few indexers compared to the overall, scantly, scant transients at all, and an extremely thick quality base. But while Berkshire and Buffett are exceptional, they are not unique. Closer to their end of the spectrum are a variety of outstanding companies who have been very good at attracting quality shareholders, the leading one of which is Fairfax Financial. Ever since Prem founded the company in 1985, he has used his shareholder letters to write a menu catering to quality. 
There's an excerpt from his 1995 letter suggesting the menu around dividend policy, shareholder engagement, and compounding capital over long periods of time. Elsewhere in that letter, Prem reported that only 20% of Fairfax listed chair, shares changed hands annually, putting it right at the bottom of the TSX, which he declared was, quote, exactly where we want to be. Uh, and then he put two exclamation points at the end of that phrase. Re readers of his letters will know he's been using the exclamation point with dramatic effect uh, way before the current president of the United States made it fashionable. <laughs> Another exemplar is Markel Corporation, also an insurance company with ownership of a variety of operating subsidiaries and a portfolio of securities, including a very large and long-held position in Berkshire Hathaway. CEO Tom Gaynor is explicit in his shareholder letters about what he wants. He wants, quote, the right owners, end quote, and he's talking about quality shareholders. Gaynor refines Markel's menu by highlighting business features that yield superior long-term economic returns. Insurance underwriting discipline, prudent capital allocation, and ownership of a diverse, permanent group of companies. In his 2016 letter, Gaynor shared Markel's philosophy of time, which concentrates on two connected points on the spectrum, forever and right now. It's amazing that a CEO can write in his shareholder letters about philosophy of time. It's a tribute to the quality of Markel's management and the quality of its shareholders. Allegheny Corporation is another company keen to attract high quality shareholders. CEO Weston Hicks, Annual letters are very well-crafted letters appealing to that cohort. Uh, a recent one laments that this breed of quality shareholders is facing extinction. It's becoming very rare. Blunt, uh, Hicks is blunt in, in his assessment of the shareholder universe today, warning about counter pressures facing quality shareholders. He notes that proxy advisors, which strongly influence the voting decisions of most of the indexed cohort publish general voting guidelines applicable to all companies that yet skew toward the transient short-term population rather than the quality long-term population. The companies I've mentioned so far all run major insurance operations, which is a business prone to a long-term investment-oriented view. Yet all sectors today face short-term pressures that are addressable by a long-term menu focused on quality shareholders. In my book, I plan to profile two dozen CEOs and their companies who exemplify this approach, including one presenting here this afternoon, Charles Fabricant of Secor, who's seated right here at table one. And I look forward to hearing from Charles a little while from now. Another company I'll feature is Constellation Software, where I've been a director for two years and recently appointed vice chairman of the board. Since taking Constellation public in 2006, the CEO and chairman Mark Leonard has repeatedly illustrated a far-sighted philosophy for the company and for the business. In his 2017 letter, he canvassed the shareholder base, segmenting it along the lines I've described, lamenting that nearly half of Constellation shares turn over in a year, suggesting there is a transient element to the base. Another chunk is owned by indexers, unavoidable, but groups that trade formulaically. But also, he salutes the very high density of quality shareholders in the Constellation base that he has worked very hard at cultivating. We have scores of institutions, hundreds of individuals, and thousands of employees who own large stakes and have and will have for a very long time. Last year, Mark announced issuing his last regular annual shareholder letter. From now on, he said, 
he will write only as events warrant rather than at fixed intervals, annual or otherwise. This has led him to write intermittently throughout the year as topics arise. This ongoing approach to shareholder communications has also replaced Constellation's previous practice of hosting quarterly conference calls. These innovations at Constellation take me to my second topic for today, the topic, a hot topic, of quarterly communications. Now, companies can offer a menu, a variety of items around that quarterly breakpoint beyond a quarterly financial statement, such as quarterly calls, quarterly forecasts, or quarterly guidance. And these menu items will attract and repel different shareholder segments. At the extremes, transients have voracious appetites for all such quarterly feed, while quality shareholders see little nutrition there. Catering accordingly, Ber Berkshire never volunteered any quarterly communications at all. And he promised such reticence as early as 1978. He repeated this reticence in this year's letter and commented on some of the dangers of a quarterly focus. A quarterly focus may induce managers to a little fudging, a little innocent acceleration of revenue, deferral of expenses, cutting R&D, waiting for CapEx, but he points out that that approach sets a new benchmark for the next quarter and for the one after that and on and on and on so that you have a treadmill of ever farther goalposts, more and more exercises to meet them that can snowball very easily into accounting fraud. In Prem Watts' latest letter, he wrote pointedly of the dangers of a quarterly focus, stressing that this in turn drives stock market trading, stock price volatility, food for transient shareholders. Some companies, including Constellation, as I just mentioned, have turned instead to periodic written Q&A. Shareholders submit questions at any time of the year we collate them, the CEO prepares responses, sometimes supported by other members of the team, and then when volume and content warrant, we post them on the website and send an email to all shareholders. Trends favor such ongoing practices which seem healthier than corporate calls and more modern. Technology plays a dual role here. From one side, quarterly calls began in the 1980s amid proliferation of conference call technology, a technology that is being rendered obsolete by internet-based communications. From the other side, high-frequency traders increasingly use artificial intelligence to monitor the sentiment in quarterly calls. Using algorithmic formulas, they detect optimistic and pessimistic statements that cause automatic trading to occur on that basis. This practice makes some transients look very long term. It's clearly a reason to avoid the quarterly call. A third way to attract quality shareholders is what Fairfax is doing today and tomorrow, hosting an engaging annual meeting where shareholders can gather together to get acquainted with one another, to meet the managers, to sample company products, to ask questions of senior leadership, and of course, George, to attend conferences like this one. Annual meetings like the Fairfax meeting are of relatively recent historical vintage. Before the 1930s, annual meetings were legalistic affairs that attracted few and accomplished little. But amid rising individual share ownership, corporate gadflies, especially the Gilbert brothers, for the next four decades began to make meetings matter. By the early 60s across North America, two dozen annual meetings drew between 300 and 900 people. Another 10 drew crowds of more than 1,000. And the record for shareholder meeting attendance of that era was set in 1965 by AT&T. 
Not all managers welcomed this level of shareholder engagement. Some of them led a movement to abolish the shareholder meeting, preferring instead to vote by post. But that met a lot of shareholder resistance and stock exchanges finally ruled that an annual meeting was required. That movement ended in 1975, which was the first year that Warren Buffett hosted an annual meeting in Omaha at Berkshire attended by 12 people. In each decade since, he's added a digit. Hundreds, thousands, tens of thousands. Last year, 40,000 plus attended the Berkshire annual meeting, which is now the world record. Uh, that's a photograph in the top left on that picture of the auditorium where that meeting is held. My wife, Stephanie, and I uh, created the book that's, that's there in the middle that Prem so kindly listed as essential reading. Uh, Stephanie and I, Stephanie Cuba, who's sitting right, right here with me today, and I um, curated the book by asking 40 veterans of the Berkshire Annual Meeting to contribute an essay explaining what the meeting has meant to them, why they go, what they get, what the future might look like. And the main theme was Berkshire's menu that appeals to quality shareholders. Again and again and again, in different ways. That's what everyone said. The upper right picture is from the Markel Corporation annual meeting. They actually have two. They have one in their hometown of Richmond, Virginia, that tracks a very large crowd, several thousand. And they have another one in Omaha on the Sunday morning after the Berkshire meeting that last year attracted 1,300 people. Uh, Tom, Mark, Tom Gaynor will sit there all day and answer questions. And we're very grateful to Tom because he was one of the contributors to our book where he explains how he began the tradition of having Markel meetings inside the Berkshire meeting. The lower right picture is from last year's Constellation Software annual meeting right here in Toronto. That's Mark Leonard. The main event there is a Q&A. We, we had about 500 people there last year. Mark and the few senior executives that we have, and then the six operating group managers will sit there endlessly for hours answering questions about the business. Historically, the last several paragraphs of Mark's annual letter to shareholders suggested some topics that people might pursue. Uh, they tended to be challenging topics, and the shareholders seized upon that and posed very difficult questions at our meetings, and that, that group, a uh, very impressive group, uh, addresses them. Uh, as for Fairfax, that's a picture from last year's meeting in the lower left. You either know already or are about to find out the extraordinary value that comes from attending and participating in this meeting. I won't give too much away. You got a taste of it this morning in the Q&A uh, with Prem, and you'll see more. It's a magnet for quality shareholders. And of course, this conference has long been a part of that tradition. Now, to put this point of annual general meetings in the context of a corporate menu, note that more than 100 major companies in the past year have moved from the live meeting to the virtual, the virtual only meeting. Looks like this. Now, not as extreme as, as the movement to abolish the annual meeting, it nevertheless strikes me as it will appeal to a different cohort. I think that because of the three arguments that proponents, those who think virtual meetings ought to replace live meetings, put forth. First, they say little happens anyway. They say having it online is better because more investors can come, especially indexers who own hundreds of companies, and it's really hard for them to attend. And third, they're just as high quality as conference calls. I'm glad I see so many Snickers because I'm sure you can guess uh, I have counter arguments to all of those points. I mean, those are great points, but they appeal very much to indexers and transients. Quality shareholders will probably not agree, and here are the three counterpoints. First, in terms of a lot not happening, well, just look around. <laughs> 300 people here are poised to attend tomorrow's meeting. There are going to be many, many more. Uh, it's a very, it, it, the possibilities are, are limitless for in engagement, learning about a particular company, and discussing other important topics. The second point is that uh, enabling lots of indexers to attend really points up a problem with indexing, not with meetings. And third, 
Uh, the idea that, uh, hey, a, a, an e-meeting is just as good as an e-conference call is like saying e-cigarettes are just as healthy as smoking tobacco. Uh, my guess is that the Fairfax meeting will continue live and in person for many decades to come, and I look forward to seeing you all here for that. George, how are we doing on time? How many? Okay. Now, why should a company care whether it has quality shareholders in its base, aren't it? Indexers and transients and so on, uh, just as good. Well, to this point, I'd like to first stress that all shareholders do contribute something important, capital. And certain segments contribute special value that others don't. For example, activists promote managerial accountability. Index funds make it possible for millions of people to get the market return at a very low cost, and traders offer liquidity. But there's a downside to all of this. Activists can become overzealous. Indexers often lack resources to understand particular companies, and traders can induce a short-term focus. Having a significant cohort of quality shareholders can provide a check against these excesses. So as to activism, quality shareholders can become what we used to call in the 80s and 90s, white squires. If, an activi if a board perceives an activist seeking uh, excessive reform, it helps a great deal to have quality shareholders to reach out to, to discuss it, and see if they agree. And if they do, that strengthens the company's capacity to respond to the legitimate concerns the activist has without tying them up around excessive demands. As to indexers and proxy advisors, well, quality shareholders have an informational and analytical advantage over them. I know a lot of analysts at ISS and Glass-Lewis, and I know they do a very earnest, admirable job in their task, but they tend to examine dynamic situations as they arise rather than developing ongoing knowledge about particular businesses. Quality shareholders with that advantage add value in resulting shareholder votes. Being long-term, quality shareholders also offset pressure of short-term trading. Instead of fixating on the quarter or the, today's stock price, a significant cohort of share, quality shareholders elongate managerial time horizons. Finally, I'm going to skip the market benefits and skip right to the final point that there's a personal factor, what I, I call a brain trust. While all shareholders contribute capital, quality shareholders can also contribute wisdom and advice. And I'll just give three examples there. Berkshire Hathaway in 2005 appointed its, to its board uh, the long time, 3%, by long time I mean 40 years, 3% stockholder Sandy Gottesman to its board, one of the wisest and most prudent investors and business analysts around. Constellation has since going public, benefited from the, the sage insight of Steve Scotchmer, a legendary Canadian investor with Manitou Capital and a very large Constellation shareholder, and Fairfax, as you undoubtedly know, over many decades was blessed with the free and wise counsel of the late Sir John Templeton. Now, there's more to say, and I want to at least save a few minutes for questions, so I'll, I'll wrap this up uh, by stressing that there are many corporate menu items that attract different kinds of shareholders, quality included. And I'll return to Phil Fisher's analogy between the corporate menu and the culinary one with this suggestion of how to segment today's shareholder universe. Quality five-star shareholders load up and stick around. Transient fast food shareholders stop by, then speed away. An index, or smorgasbord, funds may taste it all, but love none. All shareholders, all of these segments, have a place, but companies enjoy considerable flexibility in designing their menu. And so as fragmented as today's shareholder universe might be, it still just might be possible that companies get the shareholders they deserve. 
Thank you all very much for your attention.